All right, everyone, welcome back to the philosophy of art and science. I'm here today with one of my good friends, Ida B. Salomon. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Xavier Mesgan. She is a fellow Ethiopian American with her folks who came here to the greater Los Angeles area just like mine did decades ago. We grew up together here, although we didn't know each other, we met each other probably about seven, eight years ago at mm -hmm. my homeboy's high school graduation, whose uh, older brothers went to school with her in Irvine. She later also got the master's from USC. And in the interim, she did something very interesting, which is an idea that, you know, we've talked about before in this space. It's that idea Marcus Garvey popularized a long time ago, going back to Africa, repatriation. And so why don't you start us off by, by telling us kind of the first time you went back to Ethiopia, and then we could go into your more recent trip. Yeah, so the first time that I moved to Ethiopia was in 2011, and that was after I graduated from UC Irvine. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in film and media studies and a minor in African American studies. And I always wanted to study abroad during my time at UC Irvine, but it just never fit quite into my schedule. So I figured why not travel after I graduate and why not travel to Ethiopia because I can also reconnect with my culture. So I moved in the fall of 2011, and I ended up staying for about eight months. And during my time there, I was interning and later on got hired for a newspaper called The Reporter. That's so dope. Like not a lot of people can just up and, and do that. Did mm -hmm. you, you know, did you, you already spoke Amharic at the time or did you learn it out there? And were you doing stuff in Amharic or was it all English? Like how did that all go? Yeah, so I did speak Amharic before I left to Ethiopia, but obviously I got a lot better once I was able to go to Ethiopia and immerse myself in the country. Um, in terms of working at the newspaper, they had two versions of the newspaper. So they had an English version and an Amharic version. So I was able to intern and later on work for the English version of the paper. Um, it definitely was a challenge. I definitely say that if you do want to work in Ethiopia, learning Amharic to some degree is very helpful unless you end up working for like an international organization where the working language is in English. But I mean, it's just a good opportunity to learn the language because it's not one of those, like Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, obviously, is not one of those cities where everyone speaks English, like a majority of people still kind of don't. So it's just easier to navigate your way around things. Yeah, that's so good. Like you were able to maintain your independence and at least worry a little bit less. Maybe they still hustled you on a couple cabs, but uh, we could worry yeah. a little bit a little bit less about getting hustled in Mercator or wherever else that it was that you were hanging out. And then one of the times, so we met, you know, at our homies high school grad, but it was really after that that we really got to know each other when you founded Habesha LA and you know I was a early editor there and we even ran that event at the soccer tournament in 2014 yeah. that in my opinion kind of I think influenced a lot of other Habesha minded organizations that sprouted I don't know if you feel differently or think differently <laughs> yeah I can definitely see that connection because I think that um, coming back for me in 2012, I was really inspired by the different creatives that I was able to network with and meet and interview during my time as a journalist. So I just really wanted to create a hub or a space for creatives in our community in the diaspora and bring us together through different various types of events. So for me, doing the Habesha LA happy hour mixer at the tournament in San Jose it was kind of my first step in that space. And I don't think anything like that had been really done before. So it's really interesting now to see that there's so many different types of similar organizations or meetups and events. And that's great because I think that's what's really needed, especially for our community here in Los Angeles, because we're so spread out. And it really can be hard to meet a community of like young minded folks from, you know, from different sectors. So I'm really happy to see that that's continued to grow in, in different ways. A hundred percent. Like it's not just, you know, one that's going to necessarily pop off and, and take over that, that market or that space. It's like, mm -hmm. 
everybody's building on each other. Everybody's ideas are, are melding. Mm -hmm. So then one of the, I think, funnier moments was, I think it was about three years ago. Actually, actually it might be four years ago now, now that I think okay. about it. Um, uh, was it, no, no, it was 2017, right? Was it May 2017 when you went back? When I, yes, when I went back to Ethiopia so, for the second time. Mm -hmm. So that was three years ago. So about yes. three years ago, <laughs> three years ago in a month, Ida and I are talking, we go and we have some lunch and she's like, you know what, you know, um, I'm thinking about going to Ethiopia for a few months. And I laughed when she said that because I know last time she went, how much fun she had, how she was repping for her culture, you know, everywhere she went. And I was always proud of that. And I thought in my head, at least six months to a year. And I think at that time, our friend Rediet had started the Ethiopian Diaspora Fellowship as well, too. So mm -hmm. I knew that she had, like, Ida has some connections and stuff, and she's going to like it. And obviously, her skill set is going to be not like one in a million, but but pretty, pretty rare in terms of being very well balanced in being Ethiopian and being an American, which I think, you know, ups, ups your stock being highly educated too. And having the experiences of founding your organizations, I was like, I don't think you're going to spend a little more than three months. <laughs> you ended up spending three years there visiting yeah. us you know, every summer or every so often. And we would link up about once a year to, to check in, but tell us, tell us what made your original three month journey end up become a three year journey and all the cool stuff you did out there. Yeah, so I think what's really interesting is when you talk to a lot of diaspora that have moved back to Ethiopia, this is a common thread. Like you meet so many folks that say, I was planning on moving for three months and that turned into two years or five months and that turned into five years. So I think that uh, life in Ethiopia just has this way of sucking you in. I think it's just such a warm and inviting place to live. And I think that has a lot to do with our culture. Obviously it's more of a collectivist culture back home in Ethiopia than versus here. And I think that um, family life and, um, you know, spirituality and other traditions and customs are really still valued in the society. And it's just kind of nice to live in a place where it's kind of more slow paced. But I think that's also part of the reason why people end up spending more time in Ethiopia than originally expected, right? Because it can take longer to get certain things done. So I think for me, when I when I originally went to Ethiopia, I was part of a friend's wedding, and I thought this would be a great segue for me to stay past the wedding and explore different opportunities. And there's been a lot of young diaspora from all over the world, from Canada, from the US, Europe, Australia, moving back to Ethiopia and doing really cool things. and creating new initiatives. So I've just been hearing more and more stories about them. And I'm like, why not just see what I could do? I was kind of at a transitional point in my life, like with my career. Um, I wasn't working full time at the time I was temping. I was just kind of trying to find my footing, like what my next step might be. So I think it was good timing for me on a personal level. And I was able to work for different organizations while I was living in Ethiopia. So I worked for the Ethiopian Tourism Organization for three months, and I was able to learn a lot about the tourism sector in the country. I also worked for a couple of event management companies in Addis Ababa as well. And, you know, the MICE industry, which is like meetings, incentives, um, conferences and exhibitions, like they're really growing in Ethiopia. So it's basically this industry of you know conferences taking place, meetings taking place. Um, in the country because it's kind of um, like a political point in the rest of the continent as well. So I got to learn about, you know, managing conferences and managing events. And um, that was a good experience as well. But something that I, a venture that I started on my own was called Art and Addis. And I co-founded it with a friend of mine. It was originally her idea. Her name was Addis Tesfaye. She is from the U.S. as well. She's from Minnesota. She came to Ethiopia through the through EDF, which is the Ethiopia Diaspora Fellowship founded by uh, Rady Takesta. So she had already been living in Ethiopia when I when I moved. And Art and Addis is basically uh, a wine and paint event uh, that we used to host and put together. And we used to hire um, you know local artists in Addis Ababa to perform the events. And we used to have you know uh, music and wine and food, but we also wanted to expand it to be more of a social enterprise. So now our goal is to really kind of 
create more community-based initiatives through Arna Adis, whether it's helping beautifying the city or doing different programs for children. Um, I just think that art is a very underutilized resource in Ethiopia, which you know is understandable. Um, it can be hard to get access to some of the supplies, such as acrylic paint or oil paints, but everything else is locally sourced, which is something we're really proud of. Um, our canvases, our easels are locally made. And like I said, we hire uh, local artists that are young and talented and vibrant to teach our classes. And we also do private events as well. So if folks are wanting to do like a children's birthday party or a private event of any kind in their own backyard, we're able to arrange that for them as well. And um, it's been a great learning process, just having to manage something of my own in Ethiopia and just kind of understanding how the logistics of that um, takes place in such a different environment has been a huge eye opener for me. Yeah, it's so it's so beautiful. God, I want to like touch on all those things that you said. So like, with sorry, the, Hanoka, is it possible no. to quickly pause? Because I have to get my charger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on one second. OK. So you were working with the tourism. And the interesting thing about that is like you probably already have this like cursory surface level knowledge you know about ethiopia but when you work for an institution i'm sure you were flooded with all this information that you could kind of put people on more about their own country and increase that that sense of self-worth and and pride and the event spaces i've been seeing them take off i know i don't know if it's mala or male i think is one of the big ones where i saw jack dorsey the founder from square and from twitter and from cash app like out there and he even before COVID happened, he was talking about moving to Ethiopia. Like he was, he's saying he wanted to live in, in Africa in 2020 and that he was strongly considering Ethiopia after his visit there meeting like the various data scientists and, and all the people that, that would have been in that event space. But the interesting thing is the, your own project with your friend Gundist, the, the art in Addis, it sticks out to me because it's this piece of high culture. And my cousin a long time ago, she would tell me like, she was always interested in people like Izzy, you know, doing Mugabe skate, because yeah. the image everybody has is of famine and of, you know, uh, like the nineties, like the, just like everybody's starving and, you know, starving Marvin from, from South Park and all these things that, you know, you and I would have grown up with, you know, people asking ignorant questions about, does the airplane land on the hut and things like this. And, you know, your basically life and projects are showing like, no, we got this high level, high culture where we're meeting up together, you know, like it's a little bit of a turn up, but it's very intellectual as well. Mm -hmm. And we're supporting like the local entrepreneurs, the small scale stuff. You're not supporting like these huge neoliberal corporations that are coming and taking whatever they want from Ethiopia, but you're really like reaching out and, and building up the, the locals, which a lot of times, you know, the accusation of a diaspora or even of the Faranj or the foreigners who come is that, you know, it's all take and no give, but it, it shows like, you know, through your project, you know, you, you are able to, to give back to the community that you were working in. And, and that's like such a, such a beautiful thing. What, what was it like? I mean, did you need to get a permit? Like what, how easy is it to start up something like that? Like what, what were the kind of like day-to-day -day stuff in, you know, behind the curtains? Yeah. So I think one thing I want to clarify about art and Addis, um, one of our goals was to really make art accessible to all communities. So that's really one of our mantras as an organization because we didn't want our classes to be limited to a certain pool of folks. We really wanted it to start becoming like a more a known activity in the city basically because for us, one of the reasons why we started Art in Addis was because there was such a lack of social activities in mm. the city on weekends. And, you know, oftentimes people's social life is kind of revolved around just a few certain things, right? So we wanted to create something different that people could enjoy with their friends or their partners or um, anyone really, and be able to do an activity that's creative, that's fun, that's fulfilling, and also a great way to network. And at the same time, we're empowering these young artists 
um, to kind of, you know, brand themselves as artists, to be able to teach classes and to be able to have an impact on folks as well. And it's a way for them to promote themselves as artists. So that's kind of the premise behind it. Um, and in terms of like starting a business in Ethiopia, I think it really depends on the type of business that you want to start. Um, you have to research the type of business license that you would need. And depending on the type of business license that you need for your specific type of business, there's going to be different requirements. So some business licenses might require that you have an office space rented out mm -hmm. before you even apply for a license and you're going to have to show proof of rent. Or you might have to invest a certain amount of capital before you apply for your business license. So it all really depends on the type of license that you want to apply for. And a good piece of advice that I learned was that it's not too hard to open a business license, but it's really hard to close one up if you want to close your business down. So I think that for anyone that is interested in starting a business in Ethiopia, I would say being very mindful of waiting and not kind of applying for your business license right away because I've just been advised that the process of maybe closing down your business license might take a while, might be delayed. Um, and I think the process is a little bit more complicated than opening one. But that's really us, interesting. I would not have expected that. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, advice that I got from a lot of friends and colleagues that, you know, have their own businesses. So for us, we were able to partner with a location um, called Ambiance and also The Vault. So we, we worked with two different venues in Ethiopia. Um, we haven't done events, obviously, in a while due to COVID. But, um, sorry, one second. Sorry about that. Um, good. Yeah, so, um, yeah, obviously we haven't put together events for a while because of COVID, but we actually partnered with two already existing locations. And that for us, right, took away that stress and additional cost of uh, renting a place of our own. So yeah. we, we partnered with local event spaces and we used to hold our events uh, once a month. And so obviously before we launched, we started doing research. We were connecting with the community in Addis, like the artist community in Addis and trying to figure out um, different artists that we could reach out to if they would be interested in teaching our classes. So we interviewed a lot of different artists, got their information, learned more about their background. We started putting together a website. And once we had compiled enough um, information on our website, we launched our website and we also uh, featured all of our artists on our website. So anyone that's signing up for our classes can kind of get to know our artists as well. And then we did a soft launch and a hard launch. And obviously before we did our soft launch, we also had to research where we can get our canvases made, where we can get our easels made and like how much that would cost and getting like, you know, samples made before we ordered an entire batch and, you know, just kind of organize all of our materials and the process of like what it would look like in terms of, you know, for each month, we try to pick an artwork in advance. So whoever's signing up can see a picture of the artwork and already know like what kind of painting they're going to be painting. So that was kind of like what the general timeline and process looked like before we launched. And then when we did our soft launch, it was invite only. So we made sure to invite key players, people that could help promote our event. So people that worked in media, um, people that may be considered like influencers or had a large network. Um, so we were very mindful of who we invited during the soft launch. And obviously it was a complimentary treat. So we just wanted everyone to come and enjoy the experience for themselves so they can like therefore go on and like share it to their friends and family. And we also had media present. So that was kind of our strategy behind the soft launch. It's something that was very strategic for us. And I think that's really important too. And when you're launching something new is being very mindful and strategic of every step of the way. Um, so yeah, so we started continuing doing our events every month and that's kind of what our process looked like. 
That's so cool. Yeah, like I, like the there's a sense of mystery and exclusivity when you're inviting those people. It's interesting that you you mentioned potentially in addition to the media and some people you thought could, you know, were well connected, the idea of influencers in the Ethiopian circle. I know in the Ethiopian American circle, it's kind of bigger with the social media, but a while ago, I don't know if you followed it on Twitter, there was this whole debate about, you know, why aren't more Ethiopian celebrities on Twitter and things like that, you mm -hmm. know, versus maybe other social media like Instagram or, fa or Facebook. I think Facebook is probably most common amongst uh, some of my fam and friends from, from back home. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where, where were these people big? Were they just big like, like they were actors or were they big on a particular platform? Um, so some of the folks that we invited, for example, we had one man that was a radio host. So he had a radio show and he was an MC and he's also very involved in the community where like for example he works as an mc he um he does a lot of charitable works and promotes the work that he does on his facebook so i think all these people are kind of influencers in different ways um, i don't think we we outreach to any like actors or actresses or anything like that it was just folks that were either working in media or advertising advertising or marketing um because the thing about Addis Ababa, it's it's a big city, but at the same time, it's a very small city professionally. So depending on what sector you're working in, obviously, but the six degrees of separation, Addis is more like two or three. So um, <laughs> we just were mindful of kind of like who we invited. But I think that in terms of influencers in Ethiopia in general, actually Ethiopian Twitter is a great place to kind of see movers and shakers in this city on a more professional level. Um, and I think like Instagram and Facebook is more reserved for like the more traditional idea of what celebrity, which is maybe like models or actresses or singer songwriters. But I think in terms of um, following influencers in um, different industry sectors, whether it's economics, business, um, public health, I definitely would recommend being active on Twitter. Yeah, that that's so nice that you were able to do that. So you started with your soft launch, and then, and then you went to the the hard launch, and then you said COVID happened to everybody in the world. I know you're back stateside right now. I, I, is it too soon to to make a determination? I don't know if you're kind of still thinking through it, but is the thought to like go e Ethiopia all the way, or are you thinking about the states again? Well, I am definitely planning on being here for now. Um, my partner for Art and Adi, she's still based in Addis Ababa. So we're hoping that once things calm down, we can relaunch our monthly events. But like I said, we, we are still available for private events. So we have been getting requests for people, um, for us to come to their house and facilitate private events for their families. And um, she's planning on being there long term. So in terms for me, um, I am going to be based here for a while. I am planning on relaunching my marketing strategic consulting firm with my partner Radiates. Um, nice. It's going to be under the, the name Integrate Africa. So that's something that I'm going to be really focused on while I'm out here. And it's just basically bridging a gap between, you know, black and African entrepreneurs and um, us. So we offer you know different strategic communication consulting marketing consulting so that's something that we've both been working on for a while and we are just ready to relaunch so i think that's where my main focus is right now but i mean art and Addis is still something near and dear to my heart and i'm sure that once uh, things kind of go back to normal and settle down we can continue to do different events in the city and hopefully more private events and we're also planning on doing like children's workshops. So during doing different workshops like geared for children that are on break for, you know, for summer, or which is actually cramped, which is winter in Ethiopia, it's opposite. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah different seasons, different hemisphere and equatorial nation. It's, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting, like, um, there are a couple things there, right? Like, first, the interesting thing is, in launching your firm here to help people, one thing people don't know is like historically how diverse 
Ethiopia was. And you alluded to it earlier when you talk about how, you know, it's the hub of the African Union. But like my fam, part of them grew up in Diridawa and in Harar, as well as Addis Ababa. And if you look at just those three cities, like the two charter cities of Ethiopia are Diridawa and Addis Ababa, and then you look at Harar, these are some of the most diverse places. They had Armenians, Greeks, Turks, everybody who grew up in Diridawa, like in the early and mid 20th century, they all spoke like five languages. They spoke Somali, Afar, French, Italian, Amarinya. And it was really having these these two regime changes in the in the 70s with the, the Marxist regime and then in the early 90s with the, the current regime that's in power, right? The federal democracy that I think a lot of people got scared. And I think now people are seeing a little bit more stability in Ethiopia. And so it seems like more and more foreigners are are getting comfortable there when when you saw the the general scene like it, it seems like you're saying there are a lot of diaspora right? they even say that sometimes pejoratively right diaspora not true or something like that but what you, you see the people from all over right like a lot of these english-speaking parts of, of the world are, are there what, what's it like are there are there foreigners like genuine foreigners who are like not ethiopian at all like running around the city or involved in in any of these these circles that you're seeing of the two degrees of separation yeah, I mean, there's definitely a huge expat community in Ethiopia. I think something else that's important to remember is that Ethiopia has one of the highest number of diplomatic missions in the world. So in terms of like the number of embassies that are located in Addis Ababa, it's extremely high. So I think that in itself allows there to be uh, a large foreign foreigner community or expat community. There's also, you know, a lot of international NGOs that have offices in Ethiopia. Like you said, the African Union is um, headquartered in Ethiopia. We also have different UN offices based in Ethiopia as well. So I think we definitely have a lot of international organizations and offices based in Addis Ababa that, you know, has a lot of foreign employees. So I think that that could be something that's surprising for folks uh, when they first move to Ethiopia. Because I think for us as Ethiopian diaspora as well, we just kind of look like we look at Ethiopia as this kind of like we know Ethiopia because we're Ethiopians. But I think we forget how many other non-Ethiopians know about Ethiopia and have lived yeah. there and do live there currently or travel back and forth there for work or for business. So I think that's an interesting, um, interesting observation when you first move to Ethiopia and you do see the number of um, expats and foreigners that, that that live there. Yeah, and then, you know, I, I was talking to an industrial organizational psychology person the other day. Actually, our, our mutual friend Danny does that work in Ethiopia. But I was, I was talking to one here in America, and he was talking about how work environments are changing and adjusting during COVID. And so one of the things you said is now people – you know, it wasn't necessarily something that came from your mind and that you were intended, but people are suggesting these kind of private parties, these house events. And it reminds me of a culture that I've seen a lot in Los Angeles. And some of the most interesting kind of people in that space who have that work environment are private chefs. So I've seen a number of private chefs, particularly in like, you know, the those like niche diet or cuisines like vegan food or paleo food or the general low carb high fat diets. And I've seen them do pop up shops in people's homes and they're able to, you know, obviously with that level of service, because it's it's so personalized and tailored, uh, hike up, you know, their price. And and so they get more business that way. And exactly like you said, like through word of mouth, through spreading. So who knows, like. It's so interesting how many companies, even like YouTube, where you know where I'm going to be putting this up, they originally launch with a totally different idea, and then you know circumstance or serendipity, providence, whatever you want to call it, it causes them to to pivot. So it's going to be exciting following following you all to see you know how how this goes throughout the pandemic and and beyond. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that when you have such a diverse community in a city, then it does allow you to kind of start creating different types of experiences and kind of seeing how how that might be received, right? Because I think for us, when we launched Art and Addis, the majority of our attendees were foreigners. They actually weren't even Ethiopians. And that's something that we really wanted to change um, because we did want the idea of art to be accessible to all communities, not just to maybe expats or foreigners that may have 
taken like that may have taken art classes before or may have done like these sip and paint classes before in their respective countries so i i definitely do think there is an opportunity there to do different types of experiences for different types of audiences and i think that when you think about the fact that Addis Sababa in its sense is an international audience, like has more of an international crowd and a diaspora crowd. I just feel like it's room, there's room to do a lot of different types of events. That's so dope. I wish you all, all the best and I'm, I'm looking forward to following you. Thank you so much for your time again, Aydish. Yes, thank you so much for having me. So I hope this